Hello and good morning friends, welcome to the CEC Educate Live Lecture. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on history of literary criticism, today we would be conducting another session and in this session we would be discussing on Alexander Pope. We would be discussing uh, Pope as a critic and for this discussion we have once again with us in our studios Professor Bheem Singh Dhaiya. Professor Bheem Singh Dhaiya is a renowned professor of English who is admired both in India and abroad. He has authored numerous books and he is formerly Vice Chancellor of Kurukshetra University. So let's welcome our guest Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya and uh, let's um, try to grab maximum knowledge on Pope as a critic as per uh, the topic of discussion today. Hello sir, welcome to the LDC lecture. Thank you. Well, today we shall discuss Alexander Pope as a literary critic and uh, the essay which is theoretical as well as practical is called an essay of criticism. This is what Pope wrote in 1711. The dates for the life of Alexander Pope are he was born in 1688 and died in 1744. Roughly, he belongs to the early 18th century. And rightly, it is called the age of Pope. In literary criticism, in literary history, it is called the age of Pope because he was the leading poet of his time, as well as the leading critic. Uh, just as Dryden represents the 17th century and um, Renaissance, 16th century, is represented by uh, Shakespeare and others. Similarly, 18th century is represented by Alexander Pope. And Pope's essay on criticism is a seminal essay. This age is called beginning with Dryden, ending with Dr. Johnson in the later 18th century. These two centuries roughly are called neoclassical period in history of English literature. During the neoclassical period, we begin with John Dryden, which we did an essay of dramatic poesy and now we will be doing Alexander Pope and later we shall be doing uh, Samuel Johnson. So th these are the three major critics of the period called the neoclassical period in history of English literature. It is called neoclassical because uh, these writers and critics, poets and critics, uh, they were staunch followers of the classical aesthetics, which means they went back to Plato, Aristotle, Horace, Longinus. These were the ancient uh, poet critics or just critics uh, who gave ideas about what is literature, what is literary criticism, what is uh, tragedy, what is comedy, what is epic, so on and so forth. And they defined each of these literary items and gave theories about them. So Pope, Dryden, Johnson, these being the followers of the ancient critics are called neoclassical because they honored the classical. Why did they do it? That was in reaction against the Renaissance thought. During the Renaissance, there was a sort of liberation from rules. 
liberation from the past also. They wanted to look forward because Renaissance was changing the world. The world was changing from the ancient and medieval times to the modern times. This was the time when science came up and scientific inventions led to new forms of life. And that is what we have today. Modern age beginning with 15th century, now continuing in the 21st, these 600, 700 years define modern age and modernity. So, it was the beginning with Dryden. That is why Dryden is called the father of uh, literary criticism and father of the neoclassical age because it was he, the first great literary critic of the period. And in fact, in uh, English literary history, he was the first one who gave a definite book of rules about what is literature, what are different forms of literature and how they are uh, governed by certain internal rules and principles. So, we shall be dealing with Pope's essay, an essay of criticism, just like Dryden's an essay of dramatic poesy. That was focused on drama, but now it is focused on criticism. What is criticism? What kind of people become critics? What do they do? And how much of what they do is good and how much of what they do is not so good? So all that is examined critically by Alexander Pope and that is what we have in this essay on criticism. Alexander Pope, uh, I might have mentioned, was born in 1688 and died in 1744. So roughly the early part, the first half of the 18th century uh, is the age of Pope. It is rightly so called in the history of English literature. And the later 18th century is called the age of Johnson because Samuel Johnson was the major and dominant critic of that period. So these periods are named after the leading poets and critics. Uh, by the way, both Pope and Johnson combined poetry with criticism. They wrote poetry they also wrote criticism and therefore wrote with more authority. While reading Pope's essay, an essay on criticism, you shall notice, you will notice that uh, he speaks authoritatively and he speaks even curtly about his opponents, about the poets and critics he wouldn't like. So that is his temper and that is his uh, style of writing. Uh, very curt, very dismissive, whatever he does not like and very uh, praiseworthy of what he happens to like. So all this is in this essay, but a brilliant poet and a brilliant critic. Uh, you can't deny that. Uh, as a poet, he made a mark, became dominant in his own age. As a critic also, he made a mark. That's why even today, he's read and read all over. Wherever English is read, he is read as poet and critic. So one of the statements that he makes in the very opening of the essay is, but of the two less dangerous is the offense to tire our patience than mislead our sense. 
let us uh, go back to the first two lines. It is hard to say if greater want of skill appear in writing or in judging ill. He is comparing creative writing with critical writing or comparing critical writing with creative writing. And he is trying to make a comparative assessment of the two. Where does one go wrong more easily and more seriously? And his statement is, but of the two, these two are the creative and the critical activities. Less dangerous is the offense to tire our patients than mislead our sense. He means to say criticism is less dangerous than poetry. Poetry is more dangerous because you take it straight. You tend to believe what the poet is saying. Criticism you tend to examine these statements, how far it is true, how far it is not. But in the case of poetry, you are swayed by the very tone and tenor of poetry. And therefore, there is a greater danger of your uh, not maintaining your critical sense and taking things straight as they come from the poet. So, but of the two, two are the creative and the critical, less dangerous is the offense to tire our patience than mislead our sense tire our patients because the critic explains things. The critic elaborates upon the statements of the poet and gives explanations. That is why for a poem of a few lines, you have books upon books written by critics. Because to explain a single metaphor or a simile or an image or a line, you take pages after pages to do that job. That is why uh, uh, Pope is talking of the tiring of patience. But then more dangerous than that is to mislead the sense. When you take away the reader from sense to sensuousness to sleepiness. That is why he had an objection to poetry which thrives on emotions rather than on sense. So, a sort of dichotomy between mind and heart. So, neoclassical writers like Pope, like Johnson, like Dryden, they will prefer sense to sound. Whereas, some poets would prefer sound to sense. They will believe in alliteration. They will run after rhyming. But then, he says rhyming and the alliteration do not make sense. Sense comes from the mind, not from the sound. So, sound and sense are very important words, key words in with, with Pope and he plays upon them and he antagonizes each other and then explains through antagonism the difference between the two. It is with our judgments, he says further, it is with our judgments as our watches, none go just alike yet each believes his own. Elsewhere, if you remember in The Rape of the Lock, that famous poem, he also repeats this idea. He says, women and watches never agree. Of course, it is ge offensive gender-wise, but then those days he could take that liberty. You may not be able to do that today, but in that his age, 18th century, it was possible. So, he is again saying the same thing, that in the case of watches and women, 
you can't uh, be sure of agreement. They will disagree. Every two watches, every two women will give you the different uh, time, different story. So it's with our judgment, says our watches, none go just alike, yet each believes his own. He says, just like the watches, we uh, say humans, men, women, uh, we believe our judgments. We don't care what the other person is saying. We think whatever we have said, that statement is authentic, that statement is true. So each one of us believes that. The fact of the matter is every statement is not sensible enough and you have to judge it on sense. That's what Pope is saying. So don't go by personal preference, personal prejudice and keep an open mind and be open to reason. Try to reason out and try to follow the reason. And if you find the reason convincing, then don't go by your opinion. Go by the sensible opinion, which is reasoned out. So it's with our judgments as our watches, none go just alike, yet each believes his own. In poets, as true genius is but rare, true taste as seldom, is the critic's share. He says, just as among poets, true genius is one among hundreds or thousands. Similarly, he says, the man of taste, which means critic, great critic is one among hundreds or thousands. Of course, by implication, uh, he thinks he is one of those. He is one of the greatest of critics as well as poets. Uh, that is human weakness. You do that. Although he is decrying the same idea in others. In poets, as true genius is but rare, true taste as seldom is the critic's share. Both must alike from heaven derive their light these born to judge as well as those to write. He says those who are really great, poets as well as critics, they are exceptionally gifted and gifted by birth, gifted by heaven, which means God. So it's God's gift, God's grace, that you have certain quality of mind which others don't have. So he says, critics, just like poets, there is one great one among thousands. Just as among poets, so among critics, you will find one among thousands who is really great. And he's really great because he is gifted by God. He has something extraordinary about his mind, and that's why he is great. Authors are partial to their wit, it's true, but are not critics to their judgment too? He says, no doubt. Poets are partial to their own creations. Every poet would like his own poem. Better than others, maybe. There are very few who can objectively say, no, it's not really very good. And someone else's is better. It's very hard. It's very rare. He says, similarly among critics, just as among poets, there are very few who can rise above their personal preference and prejudice and can see objectively what is true and what is great and what is truly great. But as the slightest sketch, if justly traced, is by ill coloring but the more disgraced, so by false learning is good sense defaced. Some are bewildered in the maze of 
schools. And some made coxcombs nature meant but fools. He says learning does not necessarily make you great. What is more important is how much of that learning have you been able to absorb? Have you been able to make use of? He says there are people who read books upon books, but then they retain nothing. They become no wiser. Their mind does not develop to more heights, greater heights. They remain what they are. So mere reading is not enough. What is important is to digest that reading, to assimilate that reading, to be able to see what is important in that reading and what is not so important. So that is what Pope is emphasizing, that there are readers and readers. People read books upon books, but how many of them do really benefit from that reading? That is the point. Benefit will those who give a thought to their reading, who contemplate on what they have read, who try to discriminate between one book and another, how much it is relevant, how much it is not. All that is said is not so great. So this sense of discrimination, those who have this sense developed, they will be called great minds or wise or mature minds and others not. So that is why he says just reading books is not enough, but to be able to digest them, that is important. And then turn critics in their own defense. Each burns alike who can or cannot write. Well, he says, there are poets and poets. Similarly, there are critics and critics. But how many of them are really distinguished or distinguish themselves among others. Who among them rise to the top? Not many. It is always one or two in every age. He goes on and then says, some have at first for wits, then poets passed, turned critics next and proved plain fools at last. Some neither can for wits nor critics pass, as heavy mules are neither horse nor ass. Well, what he is trying to say is that you will come across plenty of people who are jack of many trades. Some are jack of all trades. For a while they were poets, then they turned to criticism, then they turned to judgments, then they turned to writing books, so on and so forth. He says, such jacks of all trades never make a mark in life. It is better to do one thing well than to do so many things not so well. So concentrate on one thing, that's his advice, and master it. Either be a poet or be a critic. Not everything. Don't try to be everything. Focus on one thing. Concentrate on one thing. Devote all your lifetime to one thing. Then perhaps you will be able to achieve some level of competence, not otherwise. 
But you who seek to give and merit fame and justly bear a critic's noble name, be sure yourself and your own reach to know how far, far your genius, taste, and learning go. Launch not beyond your depth, but be discreet and make that point where sense and dullness meet. What he's trying to say is that first know thyself. You must have an estimate of yourself. How much do you have in you? How far can you go into this journey of learning? Only then you try to read and assimilate accordingly, according to your capacity. If you go beyond your capacity, you are like, likely to make errors. So to avoid errors, stay within your limits and try to do best there. I think it's a sensible advice. Most of us have no idea of our own limitations and our own storage. How much do you have in your storage? What is your capacity? What are your limits? Aren't you going beyond your limits? The moment you transgress your limits, you are bound to make mistakes. So that is what he's saying. And obviously, Pope never speaks without a reference. The reference is to his contemporaries, because among his contemporaries, there are lots of poets and critics of minor stature, and they make mistakes. Obviously, they are to be condemned, not to be glorified. Thank you for the time being. We'll resume. Well, yeah, to resume our discussion of Pope as critic, uh, we are discussing, uh, to repeat, his essay on criticism. And as I said, uh, Pope does both. He does the theoretical work. He also does the practical work. And very self-conscious as he is, both as poet and critic, uh, he never forgets other people around him, his contemporaries. And obviously, 
he will hold himself above everybody else he wouldn't think much of anyone else as he would think of himself so uh he thinks he is the greatest poet of his time greatest critic of his time well history has proved that we also believe that he is the greatest of his time both as poet and critic well further he says like kings we lose the conquests gained before by vain ambition still to make them more each might his several province well command would all but stoop to what they understand he says poets as well as critics are like kings because the kings when they have conquered more territory they become more ambitious similarly poets and critics when they have produced a book or two they become more ambitious and they produce more books but then in this craze for more and more and more production you tend to forget the quality you tend to judge your own writings you tend to to not evaluate what you have done how far it is good where have you gone wrong what are the weak spots in your writing all that need to be critically examined and those who do not they are certainly likely to make errors this is what pope is emphasizing and obviously as i said his uh uh his indication is always towards his rivals the others and now he comes to pontificating he would give you commands for example the first one is first follow nature and your judgment frame by her just standard which is still the same unerring nature still divinely bright one clear unchanged and universal light so first commandment as a critic he is giving and that is he says first follow nature and then frame your rules your guidelines well nature is an important in fact the key word in neoclassical aesthetics and neoclassical criticism but they do not mean by nature what later wordsworth coleridge and other romantics would mean or what earlier the renaissance poets like shakespeare ben jonson or sidney they meant by nature what the new classical writers poets as well as critics what they mean by nature is human nature not physical nature not nature created by god but nature created by civilization human nature so pope's advice is first try to understand humanity human nature and then form your judgment very sound advice obviously if you don't know what man is like what human nature is like you are most likely to go wrong in your judgment so the advice is sound enough that first master nature and then do the rest because nature is one clear unchanged and universal light obviously 
the image is, the comparison is with the sun. That like the sun, which gives universal light and remains unchanged, for millions of years it has been there, it will remain there and will provide the same light. He says, similarly, nature, just like physical nature, human nature is the same. It does not change. Man was the same thousands of years ago, and he remains the same even today. This was neoclassical belief, which is not really the romantic belief. Romantics would think that man grows and therefore his view of life, his own nature also grows and every minute is it's growing, every moment it is growing. It does not remain the same forever, it is not static. But the world was static for the neoclassical poets and critics. Johnson, if you remember, we'll be doing later, also says the same while talking of Shakespeare. He says, Shakespeare held mirror up to nature. He mirrored nature, showed us the way it is without any distortion, without any magnification, showed it as it really is in itself. Just as Hamlet, if you remember, while advising the actor, says this, don't go into bombast language, nor do you underplay? But be plain, be level, be natural. The same thing Pope is saying, that the sun remains the same, so does human nature. Therefore, first master nature and then your judgment frame. You will also notice here that he is using certain key words like nature, like uh, judgment, understanding. Now these are key words in the essay. And it is necessary to know the difference between and among them. Nature means internal human nature. Understanding mind feeling, thought, these words we must try to understand and understand the difference between any two of them. They are not the same. So it is not enough to have mind. It is more important to have an understanding. Without understanding, what do you do with the mind? You may see things and yet you may not understand them. You see and you see them not. To see them in reality, you have to have the light. And that's why he's using these words. A little further, he will use the word imagination. So feeling, thought, imagination, mind, understanding, all these words constitute the terminology, the critical terminology which he is using in the essay. Life, force and beauty. Life, force and beauty must to all impart at once the source and end and test of art. So these must be combined to make the art powerful even as to make criticism powerful. It can't be just, you see, reading. It has to be followed by understanding. It has to be followed by assimilation. It has to be followed by judgment. 
how far of it is to be valued, how far not to be valued or to be less valued. So, all these discriminations are a part of learning and you learn through this exercise of reading, of thinking, of understanding, of assimilating and of finally judging, judgment. For wit and judgment often are at strife, though men teach others aid like man and wife. Wit and judgment. Wit he is using for the creative artist, poet. And judgment is using for the critical writer, for the critic. So he says poet and critic they are meant to be companions to each other, just as man and wife are. Only when you put the two together, they make one complete whole. Individually, separately, they are not the complete truth, they are not complete life. Similarly, he says, the poet and the critic must work in unison, must work in tandem, must work together because both will benefit from each other, which is true. Poet will benefit from criticism and criticism will benefit from the poet. So the two must go together. If they do not, then the cause of literature would suffer. For wit and judgment often are at strife. At times they do not go together. They are at war with each other. It is more to guide than spur the muses. Yeah, though men teach others aid like men and wife. Restrain is fury. Sorry, it is more to guide than spur the muses speed. It means criticism. Criticism is there to guide, then to spur the muses speed. It is there to, to restrain the speed of the poet, because the poet is likely to go into frenzy, into daydreaming into imaginative flight and may lose his sense, may leave his sense behind. So he says it is very important to keep them together, the creative and the critical faculties of your mind must work in tandem, must work together. Otherwise, if you keep them separate, poet separate, critic separate both are going to suffer, both are going to lose, both are going to not benefit from each other. Yes, and further he says, talking of, be Homer's works your study and delight. Read them by day and meditate by night. Then form your judgment Thence your maxims bring and trace the muses upward to their spring. Homer was one of the earliest poets. He was there in the 10th century BC, means over 3000 years ago, and he wrote the greatest poems. Just as in our languages, we have in Sanskrit the oldest texts of our epics, Mahabharata, Ramayana. Similarly, Homer wrote two epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Iliad is like Ramayana and Odyssey is like Mahabharata. But then he wrote 3000 years ago. 
and these new classical poets and critics they always went back to the classics to the classical period in between he says there have been all sorts of things mixing of forms mixing of norms mixing of ideas and mixing of values judgments and hence losing sense of what is the best what is the greatest that you will know only when you are reading the best writers the classical writers the greatest of writers who wrote in the ancient times that's why these new classical poets and critics they go back to the classical period and go back to the classics and use those classics as models he says what the modern poets and critics can do is and can do their best is to imitate the classics so that is the advice pope is giving here advice to both poets and critics that if you want to do something if you want to achieve something then go back to the classics read homer read virgil and then form your judgments then draw your rules from them then frame your judgment so learn hence for ancient rules a just esteem to copy nature is to copy them he says if you want to know what nature is he says follow the masters read the classics read the ancients and it is from their writings from their poetry that you draw inferences you frame rules you frame guidelines what is better and what is not so good it will come from reading them so at times you see the the neo classical poets and critics are called bookish no doubt they are but then they do make sense after all if you are not reading the best of writers or if you are not reading at all what do you think you can produce you are not god or god like you are not the genius for all times therefore much of learning come through reading hence pope's advice to read the classics to read the greatest of writers of the ancient times only then you will know what is good and what's not so good so do that first great wits sometimes may gloriously offend and rise to faults true critics dare not mend as kings dispense with laws themselves are made moderns beware or if you must offend against the precepts never transgress its end he says yes there is always scope for modifying the ancient rules but you can't throw them away don't commit that error don't commit that mistake you can always modify because at time passes life changes life changes perceptions change rules change therefore you do not throw away the ancient wisdom you have to follow that wisdom you can do one thing you can modify them as things have changed life has changed more literature has come more ideas have come so to assimilate all that 
in the light of new knowledge, in the light of new, you see, creative writing, you can make changes. You can modify them, but you can't throw them away. Don't commit the error of throwing away ancient wisdom. Only see wherever there is scope for modification, for changing, you change those bits and pieces. Hail birds triumphant, born in happier days, immortal heirs to universal, of universal praise, whose honors with increase of ages grow, as streams roll down, enlarging as they flow. Nations unborn, your mighty names shall sound, and worlds applaud that must not yet be found. What he's trying to say is that as time passes, as books grow old, they gather more and more prestige. They gather more and more weight. So he is giving, some will say, undue importance to things old. Well, the classical mind always does that. They worship the ancients. They glorify the ancient and ancient times. And they condemn the modern as if all that was in old times or olden times was good, and all that is now in modern times is not so good, it's bad. Well, uh, that also is not acceptable. Pope is right in many places, but is not wholly right here. Everything written in the past is not sacred. You have to. He himself was saying that you can modify. Now he's saying, no, you must value and worship what is old, what is ancient. Well, that means you become uncritical. Essay on criticism must develop your critical thinking. So what is more important is to develop critical thinking, to develop critical sense, and not to take things blindly, maybe ancient, maybe modern, whatever. Everything ancient as well as modern has to be examined critically. And only when your sense, your reason, your good sense approves of something, you accept it. Not just because it is old. And you don't discard things just because they are modern. So both ways, you have to go finally by your critical sense. And your judgment is formed on the basis of that very critical sense. We still have some time. We can do one or two more statements. Pride where wit fails, steps in to our defense, and fills up all the mighty void of sense. If once right reason drives that cloud away, truth breaks upon us with resistless day. Trust not yourself, but your defects to know. Make use of every friend and every foe. Very right. He says, don't be full of yourself. Don't blind yourself about your own uh, uh, estimate. You may be very wise, but all others are not fools. Everybody has something to give you. Therefore, try to gain from every other writer, every other critic, 
every other poet. That is how knowledge increases. That is how knowledge is gained. That is how your mind is enriched and your mind matures. Therefore, be open and open to suggestions, open to advice, open to other readings and therefore go by collective reading that you have and collective judgment that you can make. I think, thank you for the day. Or, yeah, we can still have one or two more. In every work regard the writer's end, since none can compass more than the intent. Well, he is advising us to look for the intention of the author. Well, there came a fashion, fashion in the 1930s. In fact, it began after World War I, uh, 1920s itself. The fashion was very fashionable, intentional fallacy, affective fallacy, which means if you are looking for the writer's intention, what does one want to say? He says it is fallacious. Don't look for that. Only go by your own reading. <coughs> Sorry. Well, to my mind, that is also fallacious. That is also wrong. You are not Mr. Know-all. Pope is right here. That you try to know as much as you can. Try to read more and more books written by other people. And try to assimilate. Just as the moths go from flower to flower and collect the honey, similarly you go from book to book and collect wisdom from there. All wisdom is not limited to you. You also have a spark of it. You also have a part of it, but others also have and they have had. So don't limit yourself to you to yourself and to your time. Go back to ancient times and begin there and onward march to your present day. You can see from ancient to the modern all that has come cumulatively that forms the knowledge and that should be your goal. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us a productive uh, session on Pope as a critic. And dear friends, if you have any queries or feedback, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. The lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. So keep watching us and uh, keep writing us. We would be meeting again soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Tomorrow also.